Christology. It's the branch of Christian theology which focuses on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or more simply put, Christology seeks to answer important questions like who is Jesus and what did he do? In order to grasp the extent of this subject, I would quickly point out that Christology covers top topics like the pre-existence and the eternality of Christ. Not only that, but Christology also tackles theological topics like Christ's humanity, his deity, as well as his incarnation. And finally, Christology is an examination of his death, his resurrection, his ascension and exaltation, as well as his second coming. Well, in light of this brief summation, there should be no doubt in our minds that we don't have enough time this morning to examine every aspect of this subject. However, what we can do is conduct a crash course in Christology. And as we make our way through our text today, we're going to consider what the Bible has to say about, first of all, the evidence of Christ's authenticity. Secondly, we'll consider the claims of Christ's divinity. Thirdly, we'll learn about the standard of Christ's authority. And then fourthly and finally, we'll learn about the lineage of Christ's humanity. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 22. Here we find John. He's presenting us with this crash course in Christology. Now, as you make your way to the last chapter of the Bible, I want to continue setting the stage for our text today. And so I should first remind you about John's initial vision of our risen Redeemer. Remember, it was in the beginning of this book where John tells us that he saw the Lord Jesus. He saw the ascended, exalted Savior standing in the midst of the seven lampstands, which I'll remind you, represent the universal church. John also tells us that the Lord Jesus was dressed like a priest, and he does this by declaring that he was clothed with a garment down to the feet and his chest was girded with a golden band. And so John sees the risen Lord as a priest who's making intercession, uh, intercession on our behalf. Well, furthermore, John also describes the exalted, glorified state of our Lord Jesus Christ there in the first chapter of this book by telling us that his head and hair were white like wool and as white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like uh, the sun shining in its strength. Without debate, this revelation of the Lord Jesus presents us with a very poetic picture of our Savior in his exalted state. And while this initial depiction of our risen Lord helps us to grasp the glorified state of our Savior, I'm also happy to tell you that this concluding chapter, the, the concluding comments of Christ that we find here in the final chapter of this book, uh, they're, they're, they're designed to help us to uh, better wrap our minds around the person and the work of our wonderful Messiah. And with this as our focus, if you would look with me here at Revelation chapter 22, we're going to begin reading at verse 12, because here the Lord Jesus declares, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Well, here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's once again presenting John with the prophetic promise of his second coming. And I say that this is the Lord Jesus presenting this once again. And the reason why is because this is actually the third time in this book that the Lord Jesus prophetically pointed to the time of his second coming. As a matter of fact, Jesus made this same promise. It's back in chapter 3 where he declares, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. And once again, here in Revelation chapter 22, it's back in verse 7. There Jesus also declares, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. 
Well, now here we are in our text today. We find the Lord Jesus. He's presenting us with this promise a third time. And he's not only presenting John with a prophecy that points to a second coming, but he's also promising to return so that he can reward every person according to their works. Now, for the sake of clarity... Now, that word reward there is translated from a Greek word, which not only, not only refers to awards of appreciation, uh, these awards will be received by all the saints from every age, uh, but this word reward, it also refers to the punishments which will be poured out upon every unrepentant unbeliever who has rejected the grace of God, which of course is received by faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, the word reward speaks of uh, the awards of appreciation for believers believers as well as the punishment or the wages of sin uh, for every unbeliever. Now, as we consider those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to agree that there are many different reasons for why people are rejecting our Savior. And one reason why is based on their belief that the prophetic promise of the Lord's second coming has actually failed. For example, I want to consider one argument presented by the skeptics who are quick to point out that it's been nearly 2,000 years since the Apostle John wrote this book. And with that being the case, as we consider the 2,000 years that have gone by since this book was written, uh, there are unbelievers who will insist that the prophetic promise of Christ's soon return has actually failed, and therefore they would encourage the rest of us that uh, the belief that Jesus is coming quickly uh, with rewards in hand is ridiculous. Well, I want to remind you, it was in our study last week when we considered Peter's response to the scoffers who will insist that the prophecy which points to Christ's second coming has failed. Those scoffers who will say, well, yeah, he made this promise so long ago and nothing's happened, so why should we believe it? Well, according to the apostle Peter, uh, we have to remember that the, the economy of time in God's mind is different from our time frame, right? One day, according to Peter, is like a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day with the Lord. Or in other words, the, the, the time frame or the economy of time uh, in God's mind is extremely different than ours here on earth. And, and so we can look at the 2,000 years that have gone by and think, oh, well, he said I'm coming quickly. He hasn't come yet. Uh, that's not quickly. Therefore, why should we believe he's coming at all? And yet I would point out that in the economy of time in God's mind, uh, two days have gone by so far. Just two days. Remember, a days is a 1,000 years. And so for the Lord Jesus, it's been two days since he made the promise to return quickly. And so if he were to come back on the third day, well, that is quickly in the mind of God. Now, I realize that the hardened skeptic is quick to reject Peter's point as a rational explanation. And they will say that, you know, Peter is just trying to explain away the fact that Christ hadn't come back yet. They don't believe uh, that this is a good explanation. They dismiss it as being unreasonable, and that's simply based on the fact that they don't believe in the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it. Why would a skeptic believe in the post-resurrection prophecies of a person who died back in the first century? Why would they think that there is anything to explain at all if Jesus hasn't risen from the grave? Conversely, those who are convinced that Jesus Christ has indeed risen up from the grave, well, we have no problem accepting the post-resurrection prophecies that point to his second coming, which is even why we would go in and attempt to understand how Jesus could say, I'm coming back quickly, but then it's been 2,000 years. How do we make sense of this? Oh, look what Peter says. And so we begin to look for theological explanations for what Christ probably meant. Why? Because we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we believe that Jesus spoke to John and presented this promise of his soon return. With that being the case, we should take a moment to ask then, is there any way to authenticate the claims surrounding the resurrection of Jesus? And with this question in mind, if you would hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me to the 20th chapter of John's gospel account. You see, it's in John chapter 20 where we find the Apostle John. He's recounting the skepticism of a disciple named Thomas. And while it's true that Thomas was one of the 12 apostles, it's also true that Thomas had a hard time believing in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was well aware that Jesus had died on the cross and wasn't quick to believe in the resurrection. As a matter of fact, John tells us that Thomas refused to believe that Jesus had risen up from the dead until he could authenticate the claims with empirical evidence. 
Now, with this as our focus, if you would look with me here at John chapter 20, I want to begin reading at verse 24. Here John tells us that Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Uh, The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Here in these verses, we find John describing this day when the Lord Jesus presented Thomas with the proof that he was asking for. He presented him with the empirical evidence that he was expecting. Then after examining the evidence, Thomas realized that the rumors of the resurrection were true. And he even worshiped the Lord Jesus by declaring, my Lord and my God. Now I realize that the typical skeptic will quickly accuse me of circular reasoning here by using the Bible to prove the Bible. And I I get that. I understand why why they would be resistant to this uh, argument. And yet I would simply remind them that the biblical claims regarding the resurrection of Jesus... Uh, have actually been confirmed by uh, several extra-biblical sources. For example, the first-century Jewish historian, whose name is Josephus, he confirms the biblical account in his histories uh, by assuring his audience, and I quote him, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. Now here we find this extra biblical account and in this extra biblical account we find the record of a Jewish historian from the first century named Josephus and though he never himself claimed to have become a convert to Christianity, he did in fact confirm the biblical account of Christ's death, his burial and his resurrection on the third day. And so while I fully support the skeptic's desire to authenticate every supernatural claim that the Bible makes surrounding the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I I must insist that the claims of Christ's resurrection have been authenticated, not only by the eyewitness reports that we find in the Bible, but also from extra biblical sources who are credible. And, And listen, since there's good reason then for us to believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus, both from the Bible and extra biblical sources, then there's also good reason for us to believe in his post resurrection prophecies. Therefore, we should fully expect Jesus to fulfill the prophetic promises that he made uh, when he declared, Behold, I am coming quickly. Now, how we should go about understanding that, I believe we go back to Peter and and look at what he said about God's economy of time. But the fact is that Jesus has risen from the grave And he did speak to to John and tell him, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. And based on this, we can see then that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ authenticates the prophecies that point to his second coming. Not only that, but his resurrection also authenticates our belief that Jesus is actually the incarnation of God. And and this brings us to our second point, because listen, biblical Christology is not only built upon the authenticity of Jesus Christ and, and, and and his prophecies, but a biblical Christology is also a study of Jesus' divinity. And in order to explain what I mean by this, we have to understand that biblical Christology simply presents us with a savior who is divine. And with this as our focus, let's make our way back to Revelation chapter 22. I'm going to focus your attention there on verse 13. Here again, the Lord Jesus declares, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now, as we consider the way in which the Lord Jesus was identifying himself as being this this everlasting God being the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, 
I can't help but to think about a common argument that is oftentimes used by many skeptics. And, and there are those skeptics who are quick to insist that, well, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. It's possible that you've even been attempting to share your faith with an unbelieving friend. And, and you know, as you're uh, appealing to the belief that, that Jesus is God incarnate, they, they're quick to just say, no, 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 Jesus never claimed to be God. To them, I would simply direct them to this verse because there should be no doubt that here we find the Lord Jesus describing himself as being the almighty God incarnate. In order to further prove my point, I want to take a moment to consider something that the Lord said to the prophet Isaiah. It's back in the Old Testament. I'm referring to the revelation that God presented to Isaiah in the 44th chapter of his book. It's there where the Lord of hosts declares... I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Now absorb that for a moment here because here we have Yahweh declaring, it's almighty God, the Lord of hosts declaring, I am the first and I am the last. And there is no other God besides me. And we have to think about it here. How many first and last can there be? There can only be one first and one last. And so if the Lord of hosts is claiming to be the first and the last, and Jesus is also claiming to be the first and the last, either they're both the same God or they're both lying or one is lying and the other's not. Those are our three options. There can only be one first and last. There can only be one alpha and omega. And since Jehovah, Yahweh of the Old Testament, and Jesus are both claiming to be the first and the last. Well, I'm led to believe, based on the fullness of of biblical theology, that Jesus must be divine. When the Lord Jesus claims to be the first and the last, he's simultaneously placing himself on the same level with God Almighty, and in that sense, he's saying, I am God. And so the skeptic who says, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, just take him here to Revelation chapter 22 and show him. Hey, here's Jesus claiming to be the first and the last, which is a title that God uses in Isaiah chapter 44. And I would also point out here that this wasn't the first time that Jesus makes this claim. As a matter of fact, if you would hold your place here in Revelation chapter 22, I'd like you to turn back to the first chapter of this book. You see, it's in Revelation chapter 1 where we find the Lord Jesus first presenting himself as the first and the last. And with this in mind, look with me there at Revelation 1, verse 8. Here Jesus declares, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. And notice, the Almighty. He calls himself the Almighty. That word Almighty, it's the same Greek word that God the Father uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, where he declares, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So the Father calls himself the Lord Almighty, and Jesus now is saying, I'm the first, I'm the last, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, I am the Almighty. Clearly, our risen Redeemer has identified himself as being one in the same with God Almighty. And while a skeptic might insist that this is just my interpretation of things, I would point out that the religious leaders of Israel also understood that Jesus was claiming to be God. Now, with this as our focus, continue holding your place there in the book of Revelation. I'd like you to turn with me to the 10th chapter of John's gospel account. You see, it's in John chapter 10 where we find a group of religious leaders there in the time period of Jesus. They're encouraging the Lord Jesus to tell them plainly who he is. They, they wanted him to just come right out and say with all clarity whether he's the Christ or not. As a matter of fact, look with me there at John chapter 10. We'll begin reading at verse 24. Here John tells us that the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt if you are the Christ? Tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. 
Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now here in these verses, we find the religious leaders of Israel accusing Jesus of blasphemy. And and, and though he wasn't explicitly saying those three words, I am God, they fully understood what he meant when he declared, I and my father are one. They fully understood what he meant by that. They were not confused about his terminology. The religious leaders understood Jesus to be making the claims of divinity and Therefore, it only stands to reason that a biblical Christology is based on uh, the the recognition that Jesus claims to be divine, that Jesus claims to be God. And so a biblical Christology says Christ is divine. This brings us to our third point because, listen, biblical Christology is not only based upon the evidence of his authenticity and, and the claims of his divinity, but a biblical Christology should also be based upon the standard of his authority. And uh, in order to understand what I'm talking about, it's important to grasp here that if Jesus Christ is truly divine, then he is also the one who has all authority. And with this as our focus, let's make our way back to the book of Revelation. I want you to look with me again at chapter 22. We'll pick up our study at verse 14. Here we find the angel declaring, blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Now here in these verses, we find the angel helping John to understand that the commandments of Christ have become the dividing line between those who enter the new Jerusalem and those who don't. The commandments are the dividing line. And, and, and so there's going to be some who enter in because they're the ones who do his commandments. And then there's going to be those who are kept outside during the millennial reign of our Messiah. And in order to wrap our minds around this standard of the Lord's authority, we should consider something that John wrote back in his first epistle. And with this is our focus, hold your place here in the book of Revelation, and turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. As you make your way to 1 John 3, I should take a moment to point out that the Ten Commandments of the Mosaic Law present us with a basic overview of the Lord's perfect standard. The Ten Commandments are designed to help us to grasp the reality of God's holiness. Not only that, but listen, if we've broken one of those commandments then we're absolutely guilty, completely, entirely guilty before God. And so you can look at the Ten Commandments and say, well, I've, I, I've never coveted my neighbor's donkey, right? So not guilty of that one. Yeah, but if you've lied, then you're guilty. And if you've lied about not coveting your neighbor's donkey, then you're really guilty. So if you've broken one commandment, you're guilty of all right? You're, you're guilty before God. And knowing that we've all fallen short of the Lord's perfect standard, and we have, I'm happy to tell you that the Lord Jesus is the Christ who was sent to come and fulfill the entire law for us. He came and fulfilled the law on our behalf. And now that he has accomplished this task, now sinners like us can be covered with the spiritual garments of the Lord's righteousness by faith. This was precisely the point that John was making here in 1 John chapter 3. If you would look with me here, beginning at verse 20. Here John declares, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Here in these verses, we learn that there is now no condemnation for those who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And while the law condemns those who are guilty of breaking the law, 
those who trust in Jesus Christ end up being forgiven for every sin because Jesus has accomplished the law on our behalf. Uh, the righteous requirement of the law was fulfilled through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now that he's accomplished his own perfect standard for us through his life and, and through his substitutionary sacrifice, now those who trust in him are covered with the spiritual garment of the Lord's righteous perfection. He takes his perfection and imputes it or inputs it into our spiritual account. Therefore, the blessings of the Lord end up being poured out on those who keep the commandments, which begins when we believe in Jesus Christ. When you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he accredited his perfection to your account. And so in the eyes of the Father, you are no longer guilty. At the same time, those who reject the authority of the Lord Jesus, those who will not submit to his lordship, will eventually discover that the Lord Jesus has the sovereign authority to judge every unrepentant unbeliever according to the righteous standard of the Mosaic law. For example, the Lord is going to separate his sheep from the goats at the beginning of his millennial kingdom. At that point in time, he's going to step in as a judge and he's going to be the good shepherd who says, this one is mine and allows them to enter in uh, to his kingdom and, and the goats are going to be separated and prepared for punishment. Then after the thousand years have ended, the Lord will exercise his authority by punishing every unbeliever. Not only that, but during the millennial reign of Jesus, the Lord is going to allow the planet to be populated uh, initially by those believers who survive the tribulation, but then those believers are going to have kids and some of their kids won't be believers. And for a thousand years, the earth will be repopulated and there's going to be a lot of people during that period of time who will not submit to the authority of the Lord Jesus. And it's sad to say that those who refuse to submit to the standard of our Savior's authority, they will suffer the consequences. Now, with this in mind, let's turn back to Revelation chapter 22. I want to look again at verse 14. Because here we uh, again see uh, the Lord using his authority to, to separate those who submit to him and those who don't. Notice again at verse 14 where the angel declares, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So, so those who begin by believing in Jesus Christ and then by the power of his spirit begin to walk according to his commandments by faith in Christ. They're going to have access to the tree of life and enter into the gates of the city. But those who will not submit, those who reject the Lord Jesus and his authority, well, we find what's going to happen to them in verse 15. During the millennial kingdom, we learn that they're going to be outside because he says outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Now, I believe that we do have a biblical case here for, uh, you know, not allowing dogs to live inside, but, but outside, because outside, outside are dogs, right? So keep the dogs outside, then your house won't smell. But, uh, but seriously, outside are dogs. You know, the, he's talking about unbelievers. He's talking about those who will not submit to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Outside are the sorcerers, those who are engaging in witchcraft and, 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 uh, and the use of uh, you know, you know, hallucinogenic drugs. And, and outside are the sexually immoral. Outside are the murderers and the idolaters. And notice, whoever loves and practices a lie. The Lord is going to keep all of these people outside of the gates of the new Jerusalem during the millennial reign of Christ, which helps us to see that there are unbelievers during his millennial reign, and those unbelievers are not allowed to enter into the new Jerusalem. The standard, well, it's the commandments. And the commandments begin with belief in Jesus Christ. And those who believe in Jesus Christ are then given the spirit of promise who then empowers us so that we can walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. But those who reject the authority of the Lord Jesus, they're going to be denied access to the tree of life. And listen, this not only applies to those who will eventually populate the planet during the millennial reign of, of Christ, but the Lord Jesus has already uh, given, he's already received the authority to judge every unbeliever, which is going to take place at the great white throne judgment. 
This is precisely the point that the Lord Jesus was making in John chapter 5. It's verses 25 through 29 where Jesus declares, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him all authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now based on this, we can see that God the Father has already given Jesus the authority to judge both the living and the dead. And with that being the case, it's important to understand that we won't uh, really fully embrace a biblical Christology unless we first recognize that Jesus is the righteous standard of God's almighty authority and he is the judge. He is the standard. He is the authority. He is the judge. And while it's true that the authority of Jesus originates with his divinity, it's also true that his authority is connected to his humanity. Now this brings us to our fourth and final point because listen, a biblical Christology is not only based upon the evidence of his authenticity as well as the claims of his divinity and the standard of his authority, but a biblical Christology is also based upon the lineage of his humanity. And in order to explain what I mean by this, let's continue to make our way through the book of Revelation. We find ourselves again in Revelation 22. I want to focus your attention on verse 16. Here again, we find the Lord Jesus chiming in by declaring, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Now, here in this verse, we find the Lord Jesus. He, he's helping us to grasp that uh, this final encouragement is intended for the churches. And so he's coming back and talking to the church age. This angel was sent to testify to John these things which are important for the churches. And so this is a truth that we here in the church age should embrace and fully grasp. And we find the Lord Jesus then reminding his audience, the church, about his divinity and how it was wrapped in humanity. In order to prove my point, it's important to understand the, the Greek word that's translated root there. That word root refers to the origin or, or the source of the plant from which it grows. In this sense, the Lord Jesus seems to have been making the claim that he is the source. He's the root from which the entire lineage of David has come. Notice again, I am the root and the offspring of David. So he's talking about the lineage of David, which of course comes from the tribe of Judah. And he's saying, I'm the root of all of this. He's the source from which the entire lineage of David has come. <coughs> simply put, he's the creator. He's simply saying, I am the creator of everything. And yet at the same time, Jesus here is also telling us that he is also the offspring of David, which is interesting. He's saying, I'm the root, but I'm also the offspring. That word offspring was translated from the Greek word genos, which is the Greek root for our English words, generations, genes, genetics, and even progeny. So he's saying, I'm the root, I'm the creator, but I'm also the offspring of David. I, I, I belong to the generations of David. I belong to the progeny of David. Simply put, when Jesus told John that he is the offspring of David, he's claiming to be a human descendant of King David. Now, in order to prove that he was, in fact, a descendant of David, we simply need to examine the genealogy of Mary, which is found in Luke chapter 3. There, Luke traces the bloodline of Jesus through Mary all the way back to Adam. It'd be an interesting study uh, you could do for homework. But we know, based on Luke's presentation of Mary's genealogy that Jesus through the birth the virgin birth can be traced back to David and to Judah just as the prophets foretold in order to further grasp the lineage of the Lord Jesus we should notice again there at the end of verse 16 where Jesus refers to himself as the bright and morning star 
the bright morning star. I love that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot to consider with that title. But one thing that this title reminds me of is that supernatural star which led the wise men from the east all the way to Israel. According to Matthew, those wise men were following that cosmic anomaly because they were wanting to worship the one who, whom the prophets said would be born king of the Jews. They were looking for the, the supernatural child who would be born king of the Jews. And when they arrived, they made their way to Bethlehem. And there they found themselves at the feet of Mary's child, who was named Jesus, according to command, but also called Emmanuel. That's right. Isaiah tells us that he would be called Emmanuel, which I'll remind you means God with us. Jesus is God with us the root of David, but also the offspring, the human descendant of David. Now, as we consider this theological subject of Christology, it's crucial for us to recognize that Christ, according to the scriptures, is both fully God and fully man. Both are true. He is 100% God and he is 100% man. And in order to understand why we must believe in both in order to embrace the true Christ of the Bible, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. And as you make your way to Philippians 2, I want to take a moment to remind you that the Old Testament prophets not only pointed to a Christ who would rule and reign over the entire world with a rod of iron, which points to his millennial kingdom. But they also pointed to a savior who would come and suffer and die for the sins of the people. For example, the prophet Isaiah tells us that the Christ would be like a lamb led to the slaughter. That certainly points us to his suffering. And not only that, but he also tells us that the Christ would die for the sins of the people. The prophet Zechariah tells us that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And and King David tells us that the assembly of the wicked would pierce the hands and the feet of the Christ. Now, as we consider these prophecies that point to the suffering of our Savior, we must realize that there's no way for Christ to fulfill these prophecies unless he's both fully God and fully man. If he's simply God, well, God doesn't have hands to pierce. If he's just God, then God... Well, he's not going to have feet to pierce. He's not going to to be able to wear a crown of thorns. He has to be fully God and fully man. This is precisely what Paul Paul is addressing here in Philippians chapter 2. If you would look with me, we'll begin reading at verse 6. Here Paul describes Jesus as being in the form of God, and yet he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, meaning that before his incarnation, he's equal with God, meaning that he is God. But he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Based on this text, we can see that it's necessary for God the Son to put on the frailty of humanity so that as a man, he could suffer and die for our sins. The divinity of the word put on the humanity of human frailty so that he could suffer on our behalf. You see, as God, he cannot die. God is life. And as infinite life, God cannot die. But as a man, the Christ was able to die in our place. He was able to receive the punishment that we deserve so that those who trust in him can receive the forgiveness that we don't deserve. Based on this, we see that a biblically-based Christology would lead us to believe that Jesus Christ is not only God the Son, but he's also the offspring of David and fully human. Now, as we consider everything that we've learned 
this morning as we've uh, you know, made our way through this crash course in Christology, I, I realize that there's so much more to the subject of Christology than what, what we've covered. And yet, yet at the same time, I recognize that there are many theological concepts that we've learned uh, this morning which could be easily forgotten. Or, or maybe we're still scratching our heads about it and, and needs further investigation. With that, I would encourage you to continue to in, in, engage in a study of Christology. Uh, but I would simply sum up our message today by encouraging you to remember that the evidence of Christ's authenticity is found in the biblical and the extra biblical testimonies that point us to his physical resurrection. Secondly, Jesus not only claimed to be almighty God, but the claims of his divinity have been proven by his resurrection. Thirdly, we must remember that the standard of his authority is the law, which he fulfilled on our behalf, but then we'll turn around and use as the standard of judgment for those who reject that free gift of grace. Fourthly and finally, the lineage of his humanity proves to us that the Lord Jesus is the human incarnation of almighty God. As we consider all of these theological details, you, you might be wondering, well, you know, why do we need to know all of this? Why, why, why do we need to focus on all these little details? Aren't these just, you know, theological truths that scholars need to go and, 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 and wrestle with? Why is this so important for the average Christian to grasp all of this? And with this question in mind, I'd like to answer it by encouraging you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. And as you make your way to Matthew 24, I'd like to present you with one reason for why the Lord Jesus would conclude the book of Revelation, and, and which, again, is a conclusion of the entire Bible. So we find God here wrapping up the entire Bible by presenting John with these details about his deity and his humanity and his authority and the importance of authenticity. He, he, he's bringing the entire Bible to a close with these important truths, and, and there's a very important reason why. I, I believe that the Lord Jesus is fully aware of the fact that the world is going to be filled with spiritual charlatans who will come along claiming to be the Christ. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me here at Matthew chapter 24, and, and I know that I've taken you to these verses so many times throughout our study of Revelation, and I will continue to take you to these verses. Because as the pastor of this church, I want to make sure that this flock is not deceived by the deceivers. And so look with me there at verse 3, because here Matthew writes, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Here in these verses, we find the disciples of Christ. They're asking about the signs which would reveal the end of the age. And, and you know, we, we all have those questions. We all want to know about the end of the age. We all want to know about, you know, what's going to lead up to, to the rapture and all these sorts of things. And, and there's a lot of interesting studies that we can look at and, and a lot of people talking about September 23rd. And who knows what's going to happen? I certainly don't. The Lord does. But what we do know is this, that in the last days prior to the rapture of the church and, and leading into uh, the, the seven-year tribulation time, there's going to be deceivers. That's one thing that we can be certain about, that there will be false Christs who come along saying, hey, follow me. So as we consider what the Lord Jesus here is saying. He goes on to talk about some signs that will come to pass, right? And, and a very interesting study. But I want to point out that all those signs that he points out in, in this chapter are sandwiched between the warning about false Christ. As a matter of fact, look with me there at verse 23. Here we find Jesus beginning to wrap up this chapter you know, concerning the, the signs that will lead up to, to his return. And he warns them once again about the false Christs. Beginning at verse 23, the Lord 
concludes this message by declaring, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And so early in the chapter, he's saying, hey, watch out, there's going to be false Christs who come along. But then here in the concluding sections of this of, of, of this chapter on the signs, you know, he, he's pointing out that there's going to be other people who come along, teachers who want to say, hey, follow that guy. So you've got false Christs that come along, then you've got false teachers who come along and present these false Christs. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, he's talking about false teachers. We must realize that there are false Christs. And not only that, but we must realize that there are false teachers who would have us to follow after a Christ of human invention. They want to present you with a Jesus that's not fully found here in Scripture. They've tweaked on their definition of Christ. They've fudged a little bit or they've presented an entirely new Jesus altogether. And it's sad to say that as I've you know, engaged in apologetics for many, many years and talked to many, many people who claim to be Christians, you know, but then when you start listening to what they say about Jesus, it's like, no, that's not the Jesus in the Bible. Well, we all worship the same Jesus is what they want to say. I remember debating a group of Mormons at Super Salad one day, and I know you're surprised I was at Super Salad, but... But the soup's pretty good. And so, so there was this whole group of Mormons there. And I went and sat down with them and began, and began to talk to them about Mormonism and, and their beliefs about Jesus and, and whatnot. And, and one by one, each of those Mormon elders got up and left angry because I had answered their questions and they couldn't answer mine. And finally, I'm left at the table with the mission president who was overseeing all these guys and just a few of the elders left at this table. And the mission president finally just leaned in and said, look, can't, can't we just get along? We're both worshiping Jesus here. And I said, no, we're not worshiping the same Jesus. Your Jesus is drastically different from my Jesus. And I began to explain the differences between the Mormon Jesus and the biblical Jesus. What's even worse, though, is that I've come across so many Christians who think that just because someone says Jesus, just because someone talks about Jesus Christ, maybe even has a Bible in the back window of their car, that they must be talking about the same Jesus we're talking about. We have to stop taking this for granted. And the reason why is because there are so many who are presenting another Jesus, just like Jesus said would happen. Just because someone comes to you and talks about Jesus doesn't mean they're worshiping the Jesus of the Bible. It's incorrect for us to think that the person who talks about Jesus is automatically talking about the same Jesus that we find in the Bible. And one reason for this is because there are so few pastors who will stand up on a Sunday morning and teach on Christology. And there are so few Christians who want to go to a church where Christology is being taught. They, they, I want to go somewhere where I just feel good when I leave. I want to go somewhere where I, I get the pep rally you know, that will get me through at least till Tuesday. Great, I want you to leave excited. I want you to leave happy, but I want you to leave knowing Jesus Christ. And not another Jesus, but the Jesus who is found in the pages of Holy Scripture. And so I encourage you with a study like this to embrace a biblical Christology so that you can know the true Jesus Christ. I want you to know about the evidence of Christ's authenticity. I want you to know about the claims of Christ's divinity, about the standard of Christ's authority and the lineage of Christ's humanity so that you might not be deceived by those false teachers who are saying, here's the Christ and there's the Christ. I praise the Lord that he has presented us with all of the details that we need 
so that we can follow the bright and morning star. Jesus is our bright and morning star, and he wants to lead us into his truth. And with this as our goal, let's continue our study of the subject of Christology so that we can avoid the deception of the deceivers, but so that we can also worship the true Christ who has provided us with the forgiveness of sins by faith in his substitutionary sacrifice. Let's get to know our Savior according to the way that he's revealed himself to us so that we can worship him in spirit and in truth.